everybody. Thanks for joining me as I begin to introduce a way to model our covalent compounds. Um, a primary beginning model uh, that will lead us to the structure. This model does not provide us with the three-dimensional structure, but it will lead us to uh, the three-dimensional structure, our Lewis dot structures. When we're working with Lewis dot structures, what we'll be talking about and counting are our valence electrons. These are our outer S and P electrons. These are the electrons most likely to be involved in bonding. Okay, so valence electrons are, are most helpful uh, for uh, helping us understand the molecular structure. And we'll be doing a variety of structures uh, later on. And this is going to be for elements in the S and the P blocks. We won't be dealing with our transition metals with this um, because we're talking about um, covalent compounds. So we're going to be looking at the elements in the upper right hand corner and we're going to be counting their S and P electrons. Okay, uh, so we're going to be using oxidation numbers. It's a method for tracking electrons. And we will talk about this in the context of ionic bonds because we have co covalent bonds within our polyatomic ions. So within, we have covalent. Now, sorry, got ahead of myself there. Between a cation and anion, it's ionic, but within the polyatomic ions, we have covalent bonds. So um, the method I use pays no attention to which element brought which electron. Some people do this, and I'm going to be honest with you, I think it can muddy up the equation. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at each element bringing its valence electrons as if it's a potluck. So I'm going to do an example of PCl3 in a little while. And what I'm going to count are phosphorus as valence electrons. It's in group 15. It has five. Two of them are S and three of them are P. And chlorine. For chlorine, it has seven valence electrons. Two of them are S electrons. I don't want that to look like energy levels, sorry. So two of them are S electrons, and five of them are P electrons. And so um, we would have five electrons from phosphorus. We have three chlorines, each bringing seven electrons to the table. So we're going to look at a method for distributing those 26 electrons fairly within the bonding structure. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at the guidelines first and then I'll continue my example of PCL3. The first thing you want to do, we're going to add up the total of electrons, which is what we did for that PCL3 example. Um, then if, now PCL3 is, is a neutral atom, but if we have a polyatomic ion and it's positive or negative, if it's negative like most of them, we're going to add electrons to the pot. And if it's positive, um, we are going to subtract electrons. That's for cations. Then we have to decide. We're, we'll always be dealing with a center. So we define a center. If it's a very large molecule, we define a center atom within that large molecule. So we have to decide which is the central atom. And almost all the time, it's going to be the atom present in the fewest number. PCl3, there's only one phosphorus, it will likely be the center. It's typically the least electronegative. There are some exceptions though. Hydrogen is the least, often the least electronegative, but hydrogen can never, ever, ever be in a center. Fluorine, because of the way it bonds, can never, ever, ever be a center. So that's the guidelines for picking the center. Then we're going to form covalent 
bonds between the central atom and any peripheral atom. And it takes two electrons to form a bond. And you can either use a dash for those bonds or you can use two electrons to show it. Don't use both, okay? Um, I'll, I'll show you in a minute my, what I mean by that. We're going to try to follow, try to satisfy what's called an octet rule. Most atoms are stable with eight electrons paired around them. So they need 80 electrons for stability. Now, there's, there's always exceptions to rules, right? And here are the exceptions you would need to know. Hydrogen likes one bond to it, so it will bond to some other atom. That line represents two electrons, like this. Now, you know what some teachers will do? They'll do this, because they care where the electrons came from. I don't. So they'll draw two electrons like that, and they'll join them together and say, hey, those two electrons form a bond. Not bad if you did what I just did, but sometimes, and on you know high-stakes tests, you get in a hurry, and you don't completely connect the dots. To me, that's one, two, three, four electrons because they didn't completely do the dots. So it, you get in a hurry. I really, really discourage it. Pick a line or the dots. Beryllium, man, it's a non-metal, or excuse me, it's a metal, but it likes to play non-metal games. And it will form two bonds, giving it four electrons. Boron, often, only three bonds, six electrons, three bonds. Now those you have to memorize. Other ones, if we are talking about period three and more, so periods three, four, five, with the molecule, the, excuse me, the atom can be large enough that it can have more than 80 electrons in what we call an expanded octet. You won't have to memorize that because the system that I'm showing you will result in an expanded octet, just automatically by following the rules. So memorize hydrogen, beryllium, and boron, okay? Now, what if we've distributed all of our electrons? What we're going to do is we're going to then fulfill the octet rule for all the atoms. If we have leftover ones, we're going to put it on the central atom. I like to call the central atom mama. If I have extra electrons, I'm going to look to mama. If I need more electrons, mama's going to help me out. So if I focus on that central atom, it will get me to the final result because frankly, all I care about is the final result. Okay, so after placing all the um, electrons, if it does not have a complete octet, if it is deficient, if it is something like oxygen, it has to have an octet, what we're going to do, you're going to look to mama because we're putting all extra electrons. We're starting with mama. All extra electrons will go on mama, that central atom. We're going to look and share some more. Now, this is kind of hard to see without examples. Right now, I'm giving you the rules. In another video, I will do more examples. For now, let's continue with that PCL3 example. I'm going to put phosphorus in the center, and then I'm going to evenly place chlorines around it. Remember, Lewis dot doesn't directly tell us three-dimensional structure, but it will lead us to three-dimensional structure. Now, I had 26 electrons to distribute, and we're going to distribute them in pairs. So we make our bonds. I will typically use electrons just because I think it's a little clearer as we learn about this. So I make my bonds. I like to satisfy my peripheral because then I can look to mama for extras, or excuse me, I like to satisfy my central so I can look to mama. I've used four electrons. So I have um, 22 more to place. I like to play two for you, two for me, like we're distributing candy or cookies. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 
16. Okay, I, I lost count, but I've got them all. Okay, so this is 8, 8, 8. That's 24, 25, 26. Sorry about that, but you got the idea. Now, what's helpful, it seems really random right now, but it's going to help with your memorization, is to define a more generalized structure. So we're going to assign A to the central atom, in this case phosphorus, B to peripheral atoms. We have one, two, three chlorines, so that's AB3. And then we have this non-bonded pair right here on the central atom. We are only counting them on the central atom, okay? Not anywhere else. So the central atom has one non-bonded pair of electrons. So we would call that the AB3E structure for this. Okay, so that gives you a start of how I approach these. I hope you are able to join me in my next video segment where I will do many more examples. Thanks.